Shmuel about her mother, who was born Käthe Löwenthal in Bielefeld, came to England on a kinder transport, and then became a writer and poet in the English language. Gershon is not only interesting for scholars of literature because uh, of her literary work, she's also, I think, is interesting for historians because she's one of the first who made this a subject, uh, the Holocaust, uh, in her poetry. Uh, Dr. Naomi Shmuel is a writer in her own right, and this is why, um, together with my co-editor Ursula Reuter, and I approached her for our volume, uh, Translated Memories, Transgenerational Perspective on the Holocaust, that came out in 2020. And we asked um, both scholars of literature, but also uh, writers who now write in English on the Holocaust, on the second generation, to uh, um, write essays, contribute, and uh, other writers that are to be found in this volume are Peter Wurzman or Carol Usher and uh, uh, Elizabeth Rosner and Richard Aronowitz. And uh, Naomi Schmuel contributed with a piece called Between Grief and Celebration. And since then, we've been in contact, and this is, I believe, why I have the pleasure of and uh, the honor of hosting um, this today. Uh, she has visited the University of Wuppertal in Germany, uh, from where I speak now, um, several times, uh, taught uh, and talked to our students about uh, non-racist education, um, and about her uh, job of being a writer. The topics of her mother's biography, life writing, the Holocaust, the second generation, anti-Semitism and being a refugee, you know, are key words that um, sadly enough um, are everyday um, importance, um, unfortunately today, urgent and relevant. Before we talk about Karen Gershon and Naomi's book, I'd like a little bit to outline the procedure, um, how this is going to work today. Um, you may have seen the timeline um, um, and uh, have seen we have several illustrious speakers. I'll introduce shortly each uh, of them uh, before it is their turn. If you have any questions, please write them either in the chat or uh, make a note to ask them uh, in person later. The last part of our meeting will be a Q&A session uh, led by Dr. David Clark, and then we'll uh, respond to the questions. Please note that the session will be recorded. Um, and I think everybody is uh, muted, so that is good too. And before we proceed to Professor Judy Baumel-Schwartz, who's going to give us an introduction on Karen Gershon as a child refugee, I'd like to um, start with a poem and take up uh, Naomi's idea uh, you know, that we might also listen to a little bit of her poetry. Um, this, uh, I think, sets the tone for tonight, because it is called To My Children. To my children, others may pity me, but you shall not be ashamed. How can I scorn the life which is all I have? I will not belittle the little that I have saved by denying my childhood memories, my love. How can I wish to undo the past which I am, though I beggared myself I would not become another the appalling Jewish experience is my own. The unknown victims are my father and mother. Be proud of the beginning you have in me. Be proud of how far I have wandered with this burden. I would value you less if I were not a refugee. Your presence changes my wilderness to a garden. 
All right, now here's the tr transition to uh, Judy uh, Baumel Schwartz, who is the director of the Arnold and Leona Finkler Institute of uh, Holocaust Research at uh, Bar Ilan. She's written and edited numerous books and articles about gender, Holocaust memory, commemoration, the state of Israel, and descendants of Holocaust survivors. Please start. Thank you very much. I would like to welcome all of you to this very exciting evening event for us here in Israel. It's evening, I guess, in many places that you are. It's already evening, wherever we are. And um, I actually feel that this is kind of um, a closing of a circle for me. Not the end of something, but closing of a very important circle. When I was approached by Naomi to speak in general, to actually, it was when I was approached as director of the Finkler Institute to read some of the material that she had written and to join one of our forums, um, I said, you know, many, many, many years ago, I started my career through something that your mother wrote, and I actually had the opportunity of meeting her, and this goes back, wow, I, I want to say almost 50 years ago, but yes, almost 50 years ago, when I was deciding on my master's thesis topic, I decided to write on Jewish refugee children in Great Britain. And the first book that I came across was We Came as Children, yeah. which is a compilation that her mother had put together. And that led me to the whole topic of Jewish child refugees in Britain. Now, I already knew a lot about child refugees because I have a brother and a sister who are a lot older than I am, and they were child refugees to the United States during the Holocaust. So that was very familiar, but I decided to leave that one for my doctorate and to do my master's on the children who came to Great Britain. So that was already closing one circle. Continuing on, when I started my own research and I worked on refugees, refugee children, refugee women, et cetera, I realized that I was dealing with a topic that was very close to another topic I was dealing with with my other degree that I had in political science, and that is the politics of identity. Basically, the beautiful poem, the very moving poem that we just heard is a poem of identity. And reading through almost all the material that I have ever come across on refugee children, whether we're talking about Jewish refugee children or refugee children in general, Jewish refugee children in Britain, Jewish refugee children in the United States, either reading between the lines or sometimes the lines themselves have to do with identity. Who are we? Who are we to ourselves when we think about ourselves? Who are we when we think about what other people portray us as? How do we want other people to see us? Now, I think everybody thinks about that. I know that when I go past the mirror and I look in the mirror and I say, how in the heck can I be 65 years old? I feel like I'm 18 years old inside. And that's part of identity. Well, that's like a very plain, ordinary statement. But when you are a refugee child and you say, but I come from this kind of a family and I've been raised for the past 10, 15 years to be so and so and such and such. And all of a sudden I find myself in a different culture, in a different language, in a different social group, in a different racial group, in a different whatever group you want to say. Who am I to myself? That's not a problem. But. Who am I to the people who are looking at me because that's how they're going to treat me? How do I want myself to be treated? When you read through anything that Karen Gershon wrote that has to do with herself as a child refugee, that is what I see coming through in every single poem, reading between the lines. What I left behind, what I have now, who am I? I do not want my children to be, what was the, the exact wording, to be embarrassed by me. That's your another person's perception of you, but is that your identity? What was Karen Gershon's identity to herself? Now, obviously that's the kind of question that only she can answer, but I think the next best thing is Naomi, who will be speaking about it, because she was privileged not only to grow up with her mother, but also to have access to a great deal of her writings and her private writings. And we were all blessed by the fact that Karen Gershon wrote so much and that we can get such a beautiful picture of what an incredible person she was and what she went through and how she built herself into the symbol that she was. For me, she was a symbol. She was a symbol of Jewish refugee children 
who did something incredible with their lives, who went through such terrible things, and yet at the time was writing now in the past tense, left a testimony for all of us to understand the identity of Jewish refugee children, in her case, in Great Britain. I'm not going to speak longer because we're already past the time. I just want to thank a couple of people here. And here now I'm speaking not as a Holocaust historian who specialized in Jewish refugee children, but as the head of the Finkler Institute. First, I want to thank everyone who came to this evening and who has made time in their busy schedule to be here with us. I want to thank two wonderful people that we have with us who head forums of the Finkler Institute, Professor Phyllis Lassner, who is our um, director of the Holocaust Literature and Representation Forum, which is co-sponsoring this evening, and Dr. David Clark, who is the head of the London Forum, who is co-sponsoring this evening. I thank you both for sponsoring, participating in, and what you're going to be adding to this evening. Um, I want to thank the speakers who have agreed to speak at this very unique evening. And most of all, I want to thank Naomi Shmuel. First of all, for having approached me to join the Finkler Institute Forum. Second, for enabling me to read her book even before it was published, which was absolutely marvelous. I lost a night's sleep because I just read through the night in order to read the entire book. And it's a big book for those of you who haven't read it. And once again, to thank all of you for being here and for the privilege of putting together this evening that we will be posting the recording of on our website of the Finkler Institute, and we will be sending out a notice of that. So thank you all for participating in the evening. And now I hand back the microphone to our very distinguished um, chairperson who will go on with the evening. Bettina, thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. And now I'm a little bit awed to uh, have the privilege to introduce Professor Phyllis Lassner. Uh, I am familiar with her text, uh, of course, uh, as a scholar of American literature. And I'm so pleased uh, to have the honor now to introduce you. She's Professor Emerita at Northwestern uh, University uh, in Evanston in Illinois, near Chicago. And her publications uh, often have to do with uh, the topic at hand. She published uh, Anglo-Jewish Women Writing the Holocaust. She co-edited Anti-Semitism and Philo-Semitism in the 20th and 21st centuries, the Paul Grave Handbook of Holocaust Literature and Culture, and Holocaust Literature and Representation, Their Lives, Our Words, as well as the new edition of I Was a Doctor in Auschwitz by Gisela Perl. She was recipient of the International Diamond Jubilee Fellowship at Southampton University, UK, for her work on Holocaust representation, uh, which I find impressive, and serves on the Education Outreach Committee of the Ho Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for um, Judy for organizing this and Bettina for hosting it. Uh, this is truly an auspicious uh, event. Um, I'm thrilled to be part of it. I met Naomi many years ago when I was first working on Karen Gershon's writing. And I, aside from um, we came as children, I really knew very little about Karen Gershon as a writer. But what I did know was that her writing was not only compelling, it was unlike any other uh, Holocaust writing I had ever come across. So um, what I would like to say, first of all, is that Karen Gershon's writing is surely one of the most innovative and powerful kinder transport testimonies. Her poetry, memoirs, and fiction help us to understand that the kinder transport was very much part of Holocaust history, not a sideline event. Like so many children who were rescued by Britain in the immediate aftermath of Kristallnacht, Karen Gershon lost both her parents, and all of her writing attests to the losses that haunted her as a shaping force in her life and creativity. 
As she comments in her video, Stranger in a Strange Land, quote, I don't want to be reconciled to put the Holocaust aside. I want it with me. Karen Gershon was very aware of the pitfalls facing her as a writer. Because she had escaped the experiences of the ghettos and camps, she might not have been recognized as a Holocaust survivor. Nonetheless, her survival in a foreign land marked her forever. As the following poem tells us, she was rescued into limbo. She would never belong anywhere. Quote, the world's blood and my blood were cold. The exiled Jew in me was old. And thoughts of death appalled me less than knowledge of my loneliness. Let me offer a bit of context. It was only in 1989 at the 50th year reunion of the Kinder Transport that in sharing their stories, the aging Kinder discovered their experiences were of profound importance. Yes, they were saved from incarceration in the ghettos and camps, but they were not unscathed. Gershon describes the challenge of translating the experience of being torn from family and home to make the best of a strange land and its language of indirection. Quote, one cannot respond emotionally to words one did not know as a child, but as acquired consciously with an effort. They never mean more than themselves. Their quality cannot be felt with the senses. And yet, despite her full awareness of writing in an adopted language, with each new and sometimes mystifying word, Gershon offers us the depth of her pain with searing yet elegant candor. The different parts of her German-Jewish and Anglo-Jewish identities would remain forever in unresolved tension. There would never be a stable national or cultural foundation on which her writing could lean. As she said, quote, she used English to write about an experience that's not English, the Holocaust. So intensely did she respond to the unsettling experiences endured by the kinder, fearful that their memories were fading and dying. She published her collective autobiography, We Came as Children, to which 234 kinder contributed. Her own contribution appealed to readers in several genres, but most importantly, her writing certified the Kinder Transport as a key event of the Holocaust with universal importance. Her writing also established her as a major figure in 20th century literary history. At this point, I'd like to briefly demonstrate all the claims that I've made so far with a few comments about one of Gershon's major works, her autobiographical novel, The Bread of Exile, in which she represents a German-Jewish childhood that could not prepare her for the transport and painful adaptation to Britain. As reflected in all her writing, the experience left her in a state of ambivalent rootlessness, both in her intimate relationships and in her fraught encounters with British life, manners, and morals. Painful, but also productive, Gershon's ambivalence shapes her three published novels in their narrative experiments with subject and voice. As a result, the Bread of Exile provides startling insights into the rescue experience and its disorienting legacies. The Bread of Exile startles readers with its powerfully candid voice and approach to displacement and adaptation. 
the ambivalence that drives the novel, and in particular its 13-year-old protagonist, Inga, is expressed by juxtaposing her inexpressible need for acceptance and belonging with expressions of mutual misunderstandings. The novel also exposes the willfully ignorant attitudes that could border on or exude anti-Semitism. In one example, a teacher who is predisposed to be sympathetic to the young refugee offers goodnight wishes by exclaiming, quote, sweet Jesus, have mercy on this miserable Jew. The only intervention the novel offers is the narrator's biting but supportive irony, quote, it left Inga breathless, buried under Christian compassion. In another example, Inga faces abuse for being both German and Jewish when a host employer screams at her, you bloody little hun, we were right to suspect you. She was up to no good with her sob story about being Jewish. Ambivalence as a theme and as a metaphor runs throughout the novel, connecting Inga's mixed reception and relationship with British culture to the kinder's gender and sexual identities, desires, and developments. Although Holocaust literature, especially by women, as Judy Baumel Schwartz reported so early in the study of Holocaust, uh, Holocaust and women, is rife with accounts of sexual abuse and bartering, sexuality is rarely depicted in kinder transport writing. Gershon's candid exploration of her character's fiercely emotional, sexually charged tangle of relationships is illuminating. Including adolescent sexual development, the novel argues that fiction can offer insights that humanize but do not distort or deny documented Holocaust history or provide a palliative for its unhealed wounds. Instead, Gershon's drama of teenage kinder necessitates including their unsettled sexualities because they are analogous to their feelings about being refugees. Connecting British ambivalence towards their Jewish identities, Inga asks her brother Dolph, quote, what difference does it make that you haven't a foreskin? Well, the answer is embedded throughout the novel is a lot. Written as both comic and serious, only ambivalence could dramatize the tensions that make up the kinder's developing sense of self. As the narrator tells us, being a refugee was like being in looking glass country where the kinder ultimately thrived, but theirs was not a story of happily ever after. Their rescue left them alone to make their own way through the cultural maze of adapting to their losses, to Britain, and to themselves. Thank you very much indeed. And before we kind of respond to that, let's hear what uh, Rebecca Clifford, Professor of Transnational and European History at Durham University, has to say she is prof uh, she previously worked at Swansea University and Oxford University, is the author of several monographs. And uh, she her latest book, Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust was named a book of the year by the Telegraph in the UK and the Globe and Mail in Canada. And it won the Yad Vashem Book Prize, so really an international scholar. Uh, please uh, talk to us. 
Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, well, it's interesting what, um, what Judy said before about discovering uh, this remarkable work, We Came as Children. I might say a word about my own discovery of that in a minute. Um, in 1966, I, what I want to really highlight tonight is is the year, is the time of the publication of that remarkable work, 1966. It is a collective autobiography for anyone who hasn't encountered it, uh, called We Came as Children, forged from interviews with 234 German and Austrian uh, kinder transport children, obviously, then not children anymore. It's quite possibly Karen Gershon's best known work. It's also very different from her other work. But what I think makes it truly exceptional is that it's also different from what anybody else was working on at that time in the mid-1960s in Britain or anywhere else in the world for that matter. Scholars of uh, what is sometimes called Holocaust memory, and here I, I mean sort of uh, you know collective consciousness rather than memory in individuals or families, generally argue that there was um, that you know there was always memorial activity in the earlier post-war decades, but there's a kind of an acceleration in the 1970s, and it's only towards the end of the 1970s that the term Holocaust, as we use it now, um, came to be used at all. So when Gershon began work on this remarkable project, she did so in a historical moment marked by a relative lack of interest in the Holocaust at a kind of collective cultural level, and equally a moment in the lives of child Holocaust survivors in which the past was relatively quiescent. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about that in a second. What makes the book all the more remarkable is the fact that in writing it as a collective autobiography, Gershon must have been acutely aware of something that many child survivors of the Holocaust would only discover two or three decades later. That these feelings that we've been talking about, that these fears, that these struggles with the lacunae in their own stories, you were certainly experienced individually, but they were also shared in remarkable patterns that actually crossed borders, languages, and cultures. In 1966, there was no concept of a child Holocaust survivor. There was no term. This was true for kinder transport children. It was equally true for children who had survived concentration camps. Child Holocaust survivors were far more likely to be told that they were lucky, that they were the lucky ones who had managed to survive, particularly as only an estimated 11% of Europe's Jewish children survived the Second World War. So they were often told that they were lucky to have been hidden or to have escaped as refugees, as in uh, the kinder transport children. Even that they were lucky to have been interned in a ghetto-like camp like Theresienstadt rather than a murder factory like Auschwitz, although there were certainly children in Auschwitz as well. And of course, if you have decades of being told that you're lucky, it becomes harder and harder to see yourself as a survivor. Luckiness brings with it expectations of, of gratitude and indebtedness. To be lucky enough to live when so many other children died comes with that unspoken command to focus on the future, for example, rather than to dwell on the past. Gershon and every one of the 234 kinder transport children she interviewed, I'm sure would have understood that feeling and the paradox at its heart. The book uses the language of refugees rather than survivors, which is not a surprise at all because that term child survivor only really begins to be used in the mid 1980s, first in the United States uh, with when some child survivors uh, start to form the first support groups. Quite a bit later in Britain, uh, you have to sort of jump into the early 1990s to find um, the term child Holocaust survivor used in Britain. And even, you know, for kinder, kinder transport children, for the kind of step of, of struggle to be able to say, um, we too are survivors. In working on my last book, uh, which uh, is called Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust, um, the, this is a book that looks at the story of a hundred different children who survive 
the Holocaust and it follows them through their post-war lives. So really, you know, it actually doesn't look very much at the war at all. It starts essentially in 1945 and it traces um, these children through all the decades of the post-war period. And I try to look at how they make sense of their lives at different points. So to do that, I needed to try to dip in to how they were thinking about their pasts you know, in the late 1940s and in the 1950s and in the 1960s, trying to trace the arc of that um, making sense, pro the process of making sense of where you come from. And I found that this period in the kind of, well, let's say sort of from around 1955 to 1965, that was absolutely the hardest period to dig into because there just are so few documents uh, for good reasons. The first reason is that the world around child survivors of the Holocaust was not yet particularly interested in their stories. And the second very obvious reason is that that was a moment uh, when they were caught in a real busyness of life. Uh, you know, these are you know, a child survivor is by this point, a young person who's establishing their career, raising a young family. And actually that's very draining. It drains your energy, the energy you might um, have to, to think in a more concentrated way about your past. It's one of the things that stood out uh, very much to me when I did the interviews for the book is how many of the child survivors I spoke to said, I really didn't have time to think about any of this until I retired. And I thought, oh, wow, retirement sounds great. Like you get to re you get to have a deep rethink of your life. I, you know, I can't wait, actually. But so, so this is, you know, in the kind of late 1950s, early 1960s, mid 60s is a different sort of moment. That's actually why I had my own experience when I was desperately trying to find material for this particular period of um, looking on sort of looking on the bookshelves on the open stacks at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and finding a copy of We Came as Children and thinking, oh, wow, there's almost nothing from this time. And here's something so remarkable. I was thinking a little bit about where it might fit in with some other documents from the time. One of the very few documents that you might consider parallel, although in many ways it is not, was something interesting, the only thing uh, also of its kind I ever found, a 1958-1959 follow-up study done by the Canadian Jewish Congress of the children, obviously not children at that point anymore, that they had sponsored to come to Canada between 1947 and 1952. Canada had an immigration scheme for what they called Jewish war orphans, many of whom were concentration camp survivors as well. So as part of that project, they did interviews and questionnaires with 237 of these Jewish war orphans, actually a very similar number to the 234 in Gershon's book. But it's a wholly different project from Gershon's work in its emphasis on the success of these children. It looked at whether they were married, whether they were employed, whether they were living independently, and it weighed up their success in life. And knowing this, respondents often suggested that yes, they were absolutely fine and they had no reason to complain. One of the quotes from these questionnaires that stood out very much in my mind as I looked at them was um, a, a young man who was a child survivor who came to Canada on this pro program and he said, well, look at what I started out hoping for 12 years ago and look at what I'm beefing about now. I'm happy, all right. I love that quote because I think it really brings us back to that complex indebtedness. That's the underside of that lucky, that idea of being lucky. Okay. And that's surely something that the kinder transport children knew only too well, because part of the thrust of that study was to show that the children who came to Canada had been worth all that investment, and they too wanted to show, look, we were worth it. That is a very difficult burden to live with. It's one of the things that makes Karen Gershon's work all the more remarkable, is that she got away in many ways from that issue of the, the burden. Sorry, there's a cat meowing in the background. Oh, it's you. There, um, a cat may, may appear in the screen. Um, I also was thinking about, trying to think of other documents I found that would allow us to say something more, maybe less about the collective kind of gaze and more about the individual gaze. I found myself thinking 
of what was probably the only letter I ever found from a child Holocaust survivor to the agency that had rescued her. So this was a woman named Zilla Khan, also a writer, uh, quite remarkable writer, um, but she died very young, so she didn't have a chance to publish much. It was very unfortunate. She had had um, the experience of surviving the war in hiding uh, in France, being rescued by an aid organization called the Ose, and then being uh, reunited with her father who had survived Auschwitz, but he, Auschwitz, he wasn't really capable of looking care after his children anymore. So he ended up putting them in foster care. They were sort of shun shunted from foster family to foster family. And as soon as she aged, you know, hit the age of majority, she left foster care. So she wrote uh, in 1966, the same year that We Came as Children was published, she wrote to the organization who had rescued her. And she gave a little kind of potted version of her life. And she wrote, I just think it's such a remarkable letter because there's really, really so, so few similar things from this time. She wrote, I rented myself a room. I worked as the sales girl in the ladies clothing store, a job which I had had since the age of 16. Six months later, I married my husband, who I had met in the children's home at the age of 13. I continued to work as he was attending the Graduate School of Social Work. Two years later, the twins were born, and a year and a half after that, the third boy came along. At present, I am 26 years old. The twins are five, and the youngest is four years old. Out of a far from ideal childhood comes relative normalcy. And you had a great deal to do with the fact that I'm alive. May I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Now, this letter really sat with me as I was doing research for my last book because of that phrase, relative normalcy. And the fact that only two years later, as she recounts in a later oral testimony, all of that fell apart. Zilla's marriage collapsed, her family broke up, and she embarked on a very different mission to try to make sense of her past through her writing. And she's very conscious of the fact that what she needed to say goodbye to was that effort to make her life sort of look like it bore the imprint of the relative normalcy. Um, and I wanted to read that to you because I think it all the more makes remarkable Karen Gershon's work that in the midst of a very similar time in her life, when she had young children, when she also was negotiating issues in her marriage, as, uh, as Naomi writes about so beautifully in the book, she was able to write this remarkable piece of work uh, and in a sense, you know, set aside the relative normalcy that is kind of imposed, was at the time imposed on so many child survivors. So in light of um, thinking through so many of these stories, it just comes back to me again and again, what a incredible work this is, how forward thinking and unique. And it's a real honor to even just to be here today talking about it and to have a chance to, um, to read Naomi's work. And uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for setting up the historical context uh, a little bit. And now it is Naomi Schmuel's uh, term. She wrote the first children's books in Hebrew to feature brown-skinned characters and received the Levi Eshkol Pri Minister's Prize for Literature in uh, 2011. She publishes both in Hebrew and in English and um, has done research on intergeneral relations and cultural transmission in Ethiopian immigrant families in Israel that was recently published by Springer, Children's Wellbeing in Immigrant Families uh, in, of 2023. Um, and now the recent research on her mother's biography has uh, brought us here together. Uh, please, Naomi. Thank you, Bettina. And um, well, thank you, Phyllis and Rebecca for this very interesting talks. And thank you all for being here. I'm going to share a, a PowerPoint presentation. 
Um, but it's in the wrong, wait a minute. One second, sorry. Right, now I'm gonna share it. Share. And, okay. So um, what you're seeing now is the cover of the book, which is a lovely family photograph, which is why I chose it to be the cover of the book, because it's like a, a really um, reflects something beautiful about this uh, family that was uh, uh, s soon to be uh, in the tragedy of the Holocaust. Um, well, um everybody else has talked as about Karen Gershon as a um as an author. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about Karen Gershon as a mother and a grandmother. Um and I'd like to start by uh, by reading uh a section of a poem that's called My Daughters, My Sisters. Remembering children, I confuse my daughter's childhood with my own. As they grow older, I become, the more I think of them as home, the little sister who must choose to follow them or be left alone. There are five of us in the childhood yard that we are related shows in our faces. Now I am the age our mother was when we went from her. My sisters become my daughters when I look back at them. I can love them better now because my daughters have taught me how to give. By mirroring some of their traits, they have brought them again within my reach. My daughters, my sisters have changed places. As I stood as a child, I stand as a mother, seeing the others turn towards each other, tolerating me, on their guard against one who is demanding too much. Um, so, um, uh, here, here, what you can see on the left here is a is a picture of Karen uh, actually with my sister Stella. Um, when I was a child, I always claimed this photograph to myself. I think I was a bit jealous, and I always said this was me in the photograph and not Stella, uh, because I'm the fourth child. There were less pictures of me as a as a child. In the middle, you can see me, I'm about five years old, and uh, my mother is um, being interviewed by a newspaper. It's a newspaper photograph. Uh, she's holding a book that she's just published, and this is just before we came to live in Israel. And on the right-hand side, you can see her with a baby, who is my second son, uh, Michael, whom she's holding, on the, although, although she had uh, 21 grandchildren, she didn't spend so much time being a grandmother because most of these grandchildren were in Israel and she was in England. I wanted to talk about two things which I learned from her as a mother. Uh, the first one is that love is complicated. Even love between uh, parents and children, maybe especially love between parents and children, that love comes with a great price. She, she once said to me that you always pay for loving somebody. Um, but also that one can make up for the complication of love um, with honesty, compassion, and generosity. The second thing is the complexity of identity, which several people have already referred to here. Um, and because of her story and because of her um, marriage also, I would say, um, she could not pass on to us uh, a coherent, uh, cohesive uh, identity. And yet, uh, three out of, out of uh, her four children have chosen to make Israel their home, which I think is uh, really quite interesting. Um, Uh, I found the Rebecca's book um, about child survivors extremely helpful to me while I was working on uh, my book. Um, and I found it really put everything into focus because suddenly there was this term which really described who my mother was. And if we're talking about identity, then before anything else, she was a child survivor. 
And now what you're looking at is uh, pictures of the three sisters um, that their mother, my grandmother, took these pictures um, just before they left home on the day that they went on the kinder transport. Um, she said that she wanted something to remember them waking up in the morning. And um, I feel looking at these pictures that it's just so terribly sad to imagine this woman taking these pictures of her children and then she never saw them again. Um, and I think that um, from our point of view as, um, as her children, um, there were several effects on us of her being a child survivor. First of all, um, partings were almost impossible. She, we could never leave her or she could never leave us without it being a really uh, uh, um, rousing a lot of emotions for her. Um, and yet, she, as soon as we reached the age of 15, um, she uh, behaved as if we no longer needed mothering because that was the age that she was effectively orphaned. And um, in addition to this, there was always this um, um, sort of motto of that you have to justify your existence, which also relates to the things that Rebecca said. But it was really something that was passed on to us um, uh, very strongly that you, you don't just accept that you're being alive, you have to justify your existence. Um, and also that inadvertently uh, she gave each of, us, each of us a taste of what it means to be abandoned in some way uh, at some point in our lives. Um, now, I, I sort of feel that I, I have always wanted to write her story. Um, I feel that I grew up uh, like with, with uh, a few pieces of a puzzle um, but I didn't have the whole picture. And there were so many things about our family that I didn't understand uh, why our family was the way it was or why my parents were the way they were. Um, and actually it was only um, when I was going through uh, my mother's letters to me that I remembered that it was it had been her idea that I should write the story. And she wrote to me, um, I was thinking that perhaps one day you will write my biography. I was putting my papers in order against the day of my death. You have my blanket permission to make whatever use you wish of any and all of my writing. And this she wrote to me a few months before she died. Um, and it was actually very helpful to me to find this quotation while I was working on the book and having a lot of ethical dilemmas about using her writings, write, things that she'd written, which she had not intended for publication, and whether this was ethical or not. And um, reading this quotation sort of reassured me that I was doing the right thing. <laughs> um, which actually brings me to the letters. Um, so uh, the pictures here are of uh, Lisa and uh, Karen, uh, the sisters. Um, they were separated a few months after they arrived on the kinder transport. They were separated because uh, Euthalia sent Lisa to Israel and uh, um, Karen had to stay in England. Um, it, it was a separation that was even more devastating, uh, especially for Karen because she stayed by herself, um, even more devastating than the separation from the parents. Um, and the older sister, Anna, um, she, she wasn't with uh, she wasn't with them because she was older and as soon as she got to England very soon she was interned as an enemy alien um, and after she, she she was released she she was in the ATS the British uh, Army uh, for Women and she died uh, at the age of 22 in 1943 um, so uh, really um, Karen was very much um, alone um, now uh, what happened is that in 2008, um, after my uh, aunt uh, Lisa died, my sister and I traveled to Rome in order to meet our cousins. 
And the day that we came back, um, uh, Paula, my um, uh, Lisa's youngest daughter, whom I always felt I had a very special connection with, despite the, the difficulty of language, she came and gave me this box. And she said, my mother told me to give you this. And I open it and it's full of all these letters um, dating back from the 1940s until 1993 when she died. And these are letters uh, between sisters, you know, sisters don't uh, keep so many secrets from each other. Um, so the, in the, the everything is in the letters. Um, and of course I had to deal with the issue of translating them because the letters are in German. Um, over the years, uh, various people helped me, but um, the, the the real mass of the work was done by um, two um, wonderful people whom I met actually through Bettina's book, uh, Translated Memories. So it was uh, Joseph Swan from Wuppertal University and Christoph Hauswicker from Bam Bamberg University. And these two wonderful people are very, very helpful to me in translating all these letters. Um, and really, it, the letters themselves, they were on the one hand, like opening a window onto the past and, and peeking into her life. And on the other hand, it was almost like having a conversation with her in the present. And there was also this whole, and it was also in a way like looking in the mirror, because suddenly I could see all sorts of parallels between her life and mine. Uh, which were very mind-boggling. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those parallels um, in, 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 and, uh, and what happened with them. Um, so the first parallel really is uh, being a writer. Um, I've always had a passion for writing since I was a child. On the left-hand side, you can see some of my books. And on the right-hand side, you can see some of my mother's books. Um, and uh, when I was a child, I, I used to say, well, I write and I, and I draw, but I'm, I'm never going to be an author. That's not something I'm going to be. And I said this because I didn't want to be sad like my mother. And of course, as I grew older, I could understand that she wasn't sad because she was a writer. She was sad because of her life story. And if she hadn't been a writer, I don't think she could have coped with it. And this was her way of, 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 of coping with her life story was to write about it in every possible way she could. Um, I don't feel that being a writer is a choice. I feel it's more like a calling. Um, I, I have this great motivation in the same way um, that she did. Um, so, so this is one of the things um, really that I felt a great identification with her um, in this sense. Um, the second thing is the issue of language. Um, when I first started writing uh, my book, I started in Hebrew because my intention was to bring Karen home. We lived in Israel for six years. Karen loved Israel. Um, she was really a very different person in Israel from what she was in England. Um, I think I, I explain it in the book, but Really, um, she felt at home here and she could be herself and it was acceptable. It was an acceptable and legitimate thing to be who she was here because there were so many other people who had similar stories and she could be, she could uh, uh, in some way live her Jewish identity and be a, a, um, a survivor and, 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 uh, and all that. So um, when I started writing in Hebrew, I wanted really to bring her home. This was my concept, to write the story and bring her home. And then I got to 1969, and I was writing the year, uh, our first uh, full year in Israel. And I was writing a lot of things about my sister. And I suddenly realized, well, I can't possibly publish all these, these things that I'm writing without having her read it. And my sister doesn't read Hebrew. Um, so I translated all that I'd written about 1969 so in order so that my sister could, could read it. And then I sort of continued writing in English. 
And at some point I had this really strange uh, experience of having all these files in my computer. Some of them were in English and some of them were in Hebrew. And, and then there's all the letters that were translated and the letters from German, some of which were translated into English and some of which were translated into Hebrew. And I sudden, suddenly thought, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> I'm sort of drowning in this uh, um, maze of material in uh, different languages. Um, and it suddenly struck me that I'd sort of created for myself um, the same or similar experience to that that my mother had, um, because obviously it's not exactly the same because she was, uh, uh, but but she was between languages, between English. She switched from German to English, and um, um, and there's also this whole um, we've been talking before about identity. So there's this whole connection between language and identity. And what does it say about me? What language I write in? And can I belong here in Israel if I suddenly I start writing in English? Um, and all these big questions. Um, so that that is on the whole um, issue of language. Um, and the last thing that I want to talk about is um, the issue of family. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the photographs and then I'm going to stop the share and just talk about it a little bit. Um, so on the left hand side, you can see my parents uh, when they were young. And um, this was um, in 1947 when they cycled on a, on a tandem, a bicycle for two people. They cycled to uh, Italy so that uh, Karen could see Lisa because the two sisters had been separated for eight years. They had not seen each other for eight years. Um, so the picture is in uh, Lavinio in Italy. Um, um, you can see Lisa uh, in the middle with a, her baby. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you can see a picture of uh, um, the family that Karen created, minus uh, Chris, the oldest, he's not in this picture. I could not find one single photograph from my childhood where all of us were all together. Um, and then below that, you have a picture with all of us except for uh, Karen, because this is a picture of her, her funeral. That's the way we all look a bit sad. Um, so that is my family of uh, origin. And then... This is the family that I created. I have four wonderful, wonderful sons. Um, uh, only one of them is married with children and he's here with us uh, in the Zoom today. Um, for 35 years, I was married to uh, Emmanuel, who is the policeman you can see in the middle here. And he uh, uh, came to Israel uh, from Ethiopia. Um, okay, so I just wanted to show you the pictures of the family and now I'm gonna talk a little bit um stop share so i can see you because it's much easier to talk to people when you can see them <laughs> um so the other parallel that i felt was um that uh the whole issue of uh, a woman's role in uh in, in creating a family in keeping a family together um, um, in juggling her own wants and needs and desires with the needs and desires and um, requirements of uh, children, of a husband. Um, and I would say that um, it, it, it's not by chance that uh, in the middle of writing the book, um, I left my marriage of 35 years and came to live on a kibbutz in the Galil, uh, where my where my son is living with his family. Um, because one of the things in, I discovered in the letters is that all those years, for many, many years, my, my mother actually wanted to leave my father, but she never did. And I think how many uh, women really find themselves in this situation of... of uh, um, sacrificing uh, their own happiness or, or their own uh, uh, well-being for the sake of, of this um, expectation that society has that you have to keep your family together uh, at, at, any, at any cost, at all, all, all price. And that just goes back to the, to, to the price of loving somebody. Um, so 
I think maybe this is a good place to stop. And uh, I give the, we'll go to, give, uh, back to Bettina to introduce David. Okay. Thank you, Naomi, for sharing all, you know, this intimate details with, um, you know, connected to ethical questions. We'll have now the Q&A session, um, um, which will be led by uh, David Clark, who studied uh, in Canada, is an anthropologist, and did his PhD on Jewish museums in Italy. So we have this link to Italy again. And he uh, co-edited a book on second generation visiting places connected with our family history. In, um, the title is The Journey Home of 2021 and is currently co-editing a volume together with Judy Baumel schwartz So again, some kind of closure that we have here with our first speaker on uh, second and third generation writing. Um, thank you, uh, David, for uh, doing this. Right. Thank you, Bettina, for introducing me. <clears throat> so now it's open for questions to everyone in the meeting room. Um, I was hoping maybe you, you might have put some questions in the chat, but I don't see any. Um, but if you have a question, please either raise your hand or, or there is um, uh, a react thing that you that you can raise your arm uh, I think, raise hand uh, either way so that um, we, we know uh, who has a question. Uh, I can only see, I'm trying to work out, something like 25 people on my screen. Uh, Somebody's maybe. raised their hand. You can see Margaret Stetz raised her hand. Margaret, okay, right. Um, so maybe, Margaret, you can start with the first question then. You need well, to unmute yourself. You have done yes. right. right. Yes, this, <laughs> this was absolutely wonderful, and I've learned so much from everybody. I really thank all of you for these marvelous presentations. Really terrific. My question was for Rebecca Clifford, uh, because you were putting this in the context of a particular moment in time, 1966, and saying that in 1966 there really wasn't anything about child survivors. There wasn't that kind of interest, there wasn't a field, et cetera. Um, but I was thinking about the fact that one year earlier in 1965, Jerzy Kaczynski had published the novel, The Painted Bird. And of course, it would be several years before the whole controversy erupted over the factuality or in fact the fictionality of Kaczynski's novel, but I wondered whether the publication of that novel, in a sense, opened uh, a line of interest, made publication easier, more possible, made uh, PR, you know, opportunities open because there had been this huge wave of positive reception for Kaczynski's story of a boy survivor. Thank you. This is a great question. Thank you for the question. Um, I've wondered about it myself, and not only in relation to that novel, but to others as well, such as House of Dolls, which is published earlier, it's in 55, I think, or even just the fact that this is a time when Anne Frank's diary is actually being taught in some, at least, American high schools already. You get these bursts, I suppose, uh, of attention whether and how far they make it possible for Karen Gershon to do her work, I actually don't know. Um, I tried really, really hard. I, I um, Naomi and I had a Zoom meeting and I was telling her about how much I really wanted to write a, a paper about her mother and, and her, the, the process of writing that book. And so I actually found that there was a kind of interesting collection of documents from Karen Gershon's personal papers in I think it was the University of Manchester archives. And I went along to see it, hoping there would be some kind of reflection that might open up, like what made it possible for her to write this at this at that minute. And actually there just wasn't enough there for me to be able to say, you know, here are the things that opened that door. Here are the things that made it possible. There are certainly 
there are, I don't know, pro products in the cultural sphere that do discuss the experience experiences of child survivors or indeed children who don't survive uh, in the case of Anne Frank. But they're more like sporadic and disconnected. Um, and so maybe we are working, what we're seeing is working towards a process of connection, but it's a very, a very slow one. Certainly when I think about um, going through Karen Gershon's papers in, in terms of the letter she was writing around the time about the work, she doesn't mention any of this. It's as if they're more like siloed experiences happening uh, and it hasn't kind of hit a groundswell that's enough for anyone to be able to say, you know, this opened the door for me. So I think the answer is, I don't know. It's certainly not that there was nothing. It's that the things that existed were a bit disconnected um, and a bit um, siloed, I suppose. Anita, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um... Hi, thank you, everybody. This is, um, well, having looked a lot at child survivor research recently and written a little bit about it, it's it's been really good to hear all this again. Anyway, um, I wanted some. I have a question, Naomi, that I've been wanting to know about for quite a long time now, and that is that my understanding is all the contributions that were given to her by the different people for, in making We Came as Children, she didn't keep, she didn't keep all those documents. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I I wonder why, because there's got to be, she selected out of those documents um, what she wanted, but there's so much else that could have been in it. And I just wondered if there are any documents that survived um, from those contributions. And if no, then if you have any idea why she didn't retain them. Um, yeah, well, it's pretty simple, really. It's um, she moved so many times uh, in her life. And every time she moved, she got rid of everything. <laughs> and, uh, oh. um, and I think that when she moved from um, England to Israel, um, she had this thing that she she would just uh, sort through all her papers and burn uh, 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 as much as possible. <laughs> and um, she did it on several occasions. Um, I, I wrote in the book that when she left, uh, um, when she left the group that she was living with uh, when she was 17 years old and she went out on her own, she took all the all the documents that she'd written. She'd written. She used to write stories and poems in German, and she took all the stories in Germ that she'd written in German, and she burnt them all. And she was really trying to sort of exorcise the the German cater, and become the English Karen. <laughs> and um, um, I know you asked me specifically about the the. Um, the interviews for We Came as Children, but I think it was just a sort of a, a something that she did uh, every time she moved and you can't sort of carry everything around with you. And this is a very symbolic thing, isn't it? Not carrying mm -hmm. things around with you. So um, I, I think that is the explanation. And um, mm. yeah. Thank you. Right, Judy, yes. Um, yeah, let me unmute myself. I, I have a, a general question. If I see that this is the last question, this is pretty much a, to sum up. When, as somebody who writes and who edits myself, then I know that when I finish with a book, I finished with it. It's very, very rare that I will revisit it unless I'm asked to write something additional. That, the only book that I actually did twice was my book on Jewish refugee children in Great Britain, the one for which one of the empathi was Karen Gershon's volume, We Came as Children. I wrote it as a dissertation in oh, 1979. 
And I was, I never published it. I published articles from it. And I was asked to publish it as a book. How long ago? 12 years ago, 13 years ago, something like that. So there was a 30 year difference between the two. And when I started rewriting it, I won't go into all the details, but the bottom line was the second time around that you do something, you think you're going to do it very differently. And sometimes you don't. And sometimes you do. So that's the basis of my question for Naomi. If you would start writing the book now, knowing all the things that you know, having had the experience of writing it once, would you do anything differently? Actually, it's really interesting that you asked me that question because that's exactly what I'm doing at the moment. Okay, tell us. <laughs> yes, because I promised myself that there would be a book in Hebrew. And in the end, I published a book in English. Oh, just for the audience, and, no, this this was not arranged between us. I had no idea. This is not a leading question. This was a real <laughs> question. So go on, Naomi, tell but, us about it. Yeah, and but I'm not translating. I'm not translating the book from English to Hebrew. I'm rewriting it completely differently. Um, and and while I'm, it took me a while to understand how I should be doing it. And I don't think I could have done it if I hadn't first of all written the English version. And I'll tell you why, because I think it was really important for me to get all the facts down, to have it every every single detail in the book from the point of view of the people and the dates and all the facts that are there. Um, um, so, I mean, the the book in English, it's written as a story, but it is an academic book in the sense that it includes original letters, it includes a certain amount of, of um, um, examination of the materials, um, it includes, it relates to other people who have written about my mother, including some of the people here are, are quoted, I quoted Rebecca, I quoted Judy, uh, I think Anita, but let, what, um, the other Anita is here also, who I also quoted. I can't remember the, how to say her second name. Um, so, so that was the book in English. But now I'm coming to the book in Hebrew. I know the Israeli audience. And I want it to be something that just anybody will read. And I know that, that the Israeli audience uh, uh, is, is probably uh, um, um, not very patient with long books. And um, and and everybody's always so busy all the time. Um, and I, I wanted to, to just introduce it as a story. So the Israeli, the, the version in Hebrew is a story. Now, um, when I started to think of, I couldn't, it took me a long time to work out how to do it. And it suddenly struck me one day that uh, it has to be told in the first person. And then I started writing it in the first person um, and then I got to places where Karen couldn't possibly tell this story. Somebody else has to tell this story. So I ended up, what I'm doing now is I'm writing, I'm rewriting the book as a story, um, which several people are telling. So there are bit, bits that my father is telling, and there are bits that my sister is telling, and there are maybe there are bits that Lisa and uh, Anna are telling, um, and even the par my grandparents, um, because one of the things that happens when you when you when you really get into a book is that all the people are very much alive, and I never met my grandparents. I never met them, and um, um, all I know about them is really stories that my my mother told about them or what my mother wrote about them. And yet, when I found <clears throat> When I found myself writing um, the story, they were very present in my life. I had dreams about them. I uh, I felt that they were talking to me. Um, and um, so I thought, okay, well, they need to talk in the book. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm doing at the moment. So well, that's really amazing that you asked that question because I, I meant to say this and I forgot. So thank you, Judy. Yeah. I, I also, just before I forget, another thing uh, to say is um, that um, you you all have in your email uh, after the uh, um, the link for the for the Zoom, you have a a discount voucher. I'll send it out again. Uh, there's a, a discount voucher for for um, 
purchasing the book. And I apologize in advance for the price of the book. That has nothing to do with me. I'm very sorry. But there is a discount voucher if anybody wants. Right. Uh, Nomi, I'm totally fascinated by what you've just uh, told us about how you 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 feel you have to tell a tell it the story differently in English and in Hebrew, mm -hmm. and I'm fascinated because it resonates with me in terms of the distinction between writing something purely for an academic audience and writing something for a, a more general audience and the kind of um, book I've been co-editing on second and, and now second and third generation with Judy it really speaks to that difference trying to present a story as a story that people can connect with feel some kind of resonance feel that the, the people in the story become alive and are walking with you or you are walking with them whichever way and and it it's it is about what kind of an audience are you addressing as well and it's not to some extent, it may be an English audience is very different from an Israeli audience, but it is more trying to tell the story. And you you told us you can't tell it from just one perspective, one voice. You, in order to tell that story, you, you need to present different voices mm -hmm. and make them come alive. And that ability to make, a story come alive is really the writer's craft. It is not an academic kind of skill that you, you're talking about. It is really something that is the skill of the writer in bringing forth a story and making it come alive. I don't know if that makes sense. I uh, Definitely. Everything you said, it makes a lot of sense. Um... Um, I can also say um, that there is somebody here in the audience, uh, Hannah Cohen, who has been really, really helpful to me in this process um, because I started to do it. Uh, I started to do it and um, I wasn't really sure if it was working. And I, I did a sort of draft of the first few chapters and I sent it to Hannah, the very good friend of mine and, and very uh, clever about uh literature literary uh, things um and i sent it to her and i said can you read this and tell me if it works and her comments really helped me to to work out what i was supposed to be doing because the first draft it didn't really work and she said to me i i, I get lost you it's, you're all over the place there are too many people too many different time spans to and it it was really her comments that really helped me to 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 sit how to work out how I'm supposed to do this so that somebody can read it and really understand the story and also have all these different perspectives and different time periods and because life is complicated you can't talk about life without introducing all the complexity and um and you know also um when I finished talking, so I think the first thing that Bettina said was, thank you for the uh, very personal um, um, whatever. Um, but it is personal. It's personal. Mm -hmm. No? And um, there were very, very many years ago, um, a very good friend of my mother's was uh, somebody, a, 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 a very well-known Israeli uh, author, called Shmuel Hupat, he's no longer uh, alive today. But I once discussed with him that I said to him, I want to write my mother's story. And he said to me, looked at me and he said, you realize that you can't just write all the good stuff. You have to write everything. You Are you are you willing to put it out there? And and this this is also another aspect of it. It's like taking your clothes off in public in, in a way. Oh, it's much worse. It's taking your mother's clothes off in public. <laughs> and taken from somebody who wrote about her mother also. So, yeah. yes. Yeah. 
but but that's that's that is engaging with life with yes. being human we're all human we can't we, i mean it's not pretending that you know you can't write about somebody and everything is glorious um this is life but and this is what people can relate to and this is what is helpful to people also because you know you read you read a book and and everything is wonderful it's like you don't want to read it because it's it's not realistic and you can't relate to it but if you if you read something which is had really has all the the pain and 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 uh, dilemmas and and heartaches that we all have then you can relate to it and you want to read it and and you can get to know somebody like that and it's all part of it indeed Oh uh, yes, uh, Bettina. Um, we have Axel von Ernst here. He he's the publisher uh, of the German uh, um, text of Karen Gershon. Her um, das Unterkind. Das Unterkind, right? Lesser child. Lesser child. And I would like to suggest another way of bringing Karen Gershon home is once you're done, Naomi that we uh, ha get a German translation of your book. Uh, so we have the the kind of uh, Israeli perspective here too. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> what do you say, Axel? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like the idea, uh, but you, you messed it up a, a bit uh, because you, you are, you are writing another book uh, in another style now, so it's hard to decide uh, in the end uh, which one should be translated into the <laughs> German language. Um, we we will see what what uh, what will come out uh, with your new writing now. It sounds very interesting, actually, but um, yeah, I'm not sure now what uh, what should what should be done there, um, and. Uh, just now, when when I hear your new plans with with uh, with a book um, in Hebrew, that it is a, a story and uh, um, uh, in a way lighter than the than the other book, maybe uh, it could be uh, in a in a bigger publishing house in Germany as well. We we should try to to bring it maybe. In a bigger house, not not other one. The, the Lilienfeld Verlag is a small a small publishing house with with uh, less um, with lesser power, and um, it could be interesting enough uh, for a, a broader audience here. So let's see um, what you <laughs> what, will, what will come from you, and and then we we check the the market <laughs> and maybe find an agency or something. I don't know. But but in in any case, um, it is very important to have uh, Karen Gershon back in Germany. The uh, the last um, editions of her works were in the nineties, uh, and uh, now we uh, we re um, re published um, Das Unterkind, uh, the lesser child, uh, or a lesser child yeah, in. Uh, in English, and uh, of course, we came as children should be republished too. It's a very important uh, book, uh, if not the most important of her uh, works, and and so on. We Lilienfeld Verlag in in Düsseldorf, we we want to continue here, uh, but concerning your books, maybe um, it could be in another place, uh, also as a promotion for your mother, you know. So. <laughs> we should reach a broader audience with your book to promote our books here in the Leading Fed for Dark, your mother's books. So that's it. And and um, I like the event here and it's really interesting to to see you all and uh, and it was interesting to, to listen to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Bettina, but where's Bettina? I can't see you. Here, here I am. <laughs> so, yeah. would you like to close up? We, 
before we uh, close, I just want to say I need to brush up on my Hebrew now. Um, maybe <laughs> some some others here too. Uh, this is wonderful news and um, wishing you all the best um, with the book uh, sale all over the world. Um, you deserve it and your mom deserves it. And thank you everyone. For, uh, that was also a wonderful discussion um all the panelists and uh the audience um well good luck and good night thank yeah, you very thank much you. really for joining everybody really appreciate thank you very much yeah. <laughs> good night good night, good night.